a high percentage of small businesses fail. So it's no surprise the Dragons drive a hard bargain, given the risks they're taking. So will they want to take a chance with our next entrepreneur, Martin Wadsworth from Atherton near Manchester? Right, where to start? My name is Martin Wadsworth. I'm looking for £150,000 for a 10% stake. The company is Discreet Heat, and we've uh, developed, designed, patented, and are currently manufacturing and selling a very innovative and energy efficient form of room heating. The two main protagonists in the room space heating market are radiators and underfloor heating, and I'm sure you're familiar with both of those. The radiator market is £180 million in the UK. The downside of radiators is they are universally disliked by the, the homeowner and they're not particularly energy efficient because of the way they convect the heat rather than radiate the heat. So, my proposition to you today is a central heating system that is as simple uh, to install as a radiator, as responsive as a radiator, it feels like underfloor heating when it's on. It can be retrofitted into existing properties as well as fitted into new and has been independently tested and proven to be more energy efficient than both radiators and underfloor. I'm not going to tell you about my product. I'm actually going to demonstrate it to you because it's actually here working now. So the first thing I'll do is move the radiator, as indeed a great many people would do. And I'd like you to actually come and try it, if you would. <coughs> it's actually here, and it's working right now. You've got some sort of heating system behind the skirting board? No, it is the skirting board. It is the skirting board. The, the skirting, skirting board, board actually is the heating system. Inventor Martin Wadsworth has devised an ingenious new heating system that disguises a radiator as a normal skirting board. Now, in exchange for 10% equity, he needs £150,000 to expand the business. James Kahn wants to get down to numbers. What's the average size of a room? Four by four. OK, and the cost of putting tubing round a standard room yeah. and a radiator costs how much? A standard radiator for four before room is about a hundred pounds supply only. Okay. And if I bought your product with the skirting board around a standard room, what's the difference in? It's about four hundred to four hundred and thirty pounds. Okay. So if people who are purchasing this product, it's four times more expensive. Yes. Than the convention. Why would they do that? Well. Two reasons. One is they don't particularly like the radiators on the wall in the first place. I agree with that, yeah. Secondly, it's a more practical alternative to underfloor heating because taking up your floors sure. is, uh, is, is not practical in, in most applications. So we sort of price the product to fall between the two. OK. I actually think it's a great idea as a concept. It looks pretty neat to me. Martin's composure is holding under the pressure. But what's unique about his heating system? Deborah Meaden wants to know. Uh, you've hit me at quite a good moment because I've just been through exactly this process of what type of heating do I put in the house. Is it protected? Yes, we have patented the ovality. We've patented the clip which holds the connectors into the skirting themselves. The bottom piece is designed to come off, so if you're retrofitting laminate and carpet to an existing property, you can get right under, you don't have the timber beads. You can hide your audio, visual and speaker cables around the room without having to bury them under the carpet. The top gasket comes off for painting and decorating, so from the house builder's point of view, they're not corking the top of the skirting because it's already done for you, and obviously they don't have to be quite so precise as putting it in, and that's patented. Mum. Yes? Sounds very simple, but there are drawbacks, aren't there? No? Well, there, well, well I'm waiting to hear what you think the drawbacks are. Why don't you tell me? What I think the drawbacks are, mm. are they? So you want me to talk about the problems with my product? Yeah. Uh, uh, you've, you, you've, uh, OK. You've identified that you think there's drawbacks, and I would ask you to just tell me what you think okay. they are. 
If you tried to do this retro, it would cost a fortune. Why? To, well, okay, if you can come into my house and take all the radiators off, yeah. redecorate, repaint, re-wallpaper and fit this without a lot of cost, then come and do it. Well, if you give me an address, I'll come round. Okay, so let's talk about your turnover and profit in your company. Okay. In your first year, what was the turnover and profit? £158,000 turnover. Profit? Net loss, 188000 Year two? Uh, well, we've done six months so far, and we've done 300000 forecasting a small profit of 8000 at the end of year two. So, but today you've made a huge loss on this company. Yes. How have you financed it? I've funded it myself. So how much have you put in this company so far? About 400,000. It's a robust entrepreneur who stands up this well to a bout of verbal sparring with Duncan Bannatyne. But Peter Jones is troubled by the 400,000 pounds Martin has already sunk into the business. Who have you been to to go and raise money to see this? I haven't been to anybody to raise financial support. I have had plenty of offers. So you've not spoken to anybody before, apart from now? Uh, that's right, yes. Yeah. I've been using my own resources, and I will continue to use my own resources. And have you come to a point that you feel that actually you've used up so much resources that I know what I'll do, I'll raise some money because I'm in trouble? No, it's quite the opposite, actually. What I really want to do is I want to be able to find an investor who can get our product recognised at um, within the powers that be, if you like, and that will turn over the market in our favour. And as a small manufacturer competing against huge imported products, it's a difficult swim. Well, I, I'm going to tell you where I am because I, I don't want to waste words, really. Okay. Um, I know nothing about this marketplace and I wouldn't really know yeah. where to go with it. So that's the reason why I'm going to declare myself out. It's Martin's first setback as Peter Jones walks away from the deal. Will Deborah Meaden see more potential for an investor? I have to tell you, I don't... Visually, I don't like the product. So, I, and I can put that to one side, because if it's a good investment and there is a use for it, I would invest in it. The biggest issue I've got is the cost of this mm. against standard product. So I'm, I'm afraid I'm That's out. That's a shame. Thank you. Martin, can I, can I come in here? I mean, you're obviously very passionate about this, and... You invented it? Well, myself and my colleague did, yes. What gave you the idea? I've been in property development for five years and wherever I put a radiator, it was always in the wrong position. I looked at underfloor heating and it was a complete nightmare. We tried storage heaters, we tried panel heaters. And then some plumber said to me, he said, why don't you try skirting radiators? So that's a good idea. So I went back to basics, I took a piece of MDF skirting, I gave it to my colleague and I said, I want that with two pipes in it in aluminium and we can use it as a radiator. And the whole thing's kind of gone on from there. You were a, a successful developer? Did you say? I, I did OK. did OK. Well, you found £400,000... Yes. ..to invest in this business. Yes. You have no borrowings. Uh, no. You've got money in the bank. Yes. If I said to you, Martin, I've got a sure-fire winner of an idea... Mm-hmm. ..and I could do with you investing a couple of hundred thousand pounds in it. Could you lay your hands on it? If I had to, yes. You could do? Yes. Then you don't need to be here, so I don't know why you're here. And since you don't need my investment, I'm out as well. Three dragons out. James Kahn seemed impressed by the pitch at the outset. Will he be willing to back Martin with a £150,000 investment? I really like the product. Thank you. I think it's very ingeniously designed as a concept. I think you're a very bright guy. You clearly know exactly what you're doing. So I'm sitting here thinking that you've invested £400,000 of your own money. Mm -hmm. But if you can't make it work, I'm not... I can't understand what am I going to do that's going to make a difference. So I think it's a shame, because if I could find a way mm. of convincing myself <clears throat> you'll make money out of this, I would invest. OK. Regressively, I'm out. Martin's last hope of securing the cash injection now rests with Duncan Bannatyne, and the two have already locked horns in the den. OK, Martin, to solve all the problems of, of, of the script, why don't you just get two pieces of oval piping like this, 
stick them on the wall, and then the John puts the skirting board on top. What sort of skirting board on top? Aluminium? MDF. Skirt? Well, MDF would not radiate the heat, would it? It has to be a metal surface to actually radiate the heat. And who makes oval pipes apart from us? Well, you make oval pipes. Mm -hmm. So, said, why don't you, who makes oval pipe, stick the oval pipes on the wall? Right. And then put the skirting board on top of the pipes. So now I've got why to... Why attach them to this? As soon as you join two substances together, that's where you get losses. So it's an integral part of the radiating surface. And, and I think it'd be more complicated to install to put two pipes on the wall and then hope to clip a, a fascia on the front of it. I mean, it, it's an idea, but uh, I won't be exploring it. <laughs> 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 well, I'm still exploring the business in this, Martin. Are you hoping I'm going to see I'm out? I hope not. I think you can bring something to the party. I certainly hope you can. Thank you. That's because I'm the cleverest dragon, isn't it? Quite possibly. Yeah. As you're the only one left in, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm clever enough to know that this is not a business proposition. Really? Okay. Really, it's not a great inve investment. It doesn't work. And so for that reason, Martin, I'm out. OK, I take it back. You're not the cleverest dragon. <laughs> <laughs> Here, right, cheers. I appreciate your time, mate. Good, <laughs> Good luck. Thank, Thank, Thank you, Jim. A good humoured exchange, perhaps, but Martin walked away without investment. I'm not sure why they didn't invest. I, I don't really know. I mean, given the chance, I might ask them that question. Twelve months on, and it's James Kahn who's travelled to Atherton to find out if this is an investment he should have made. Hi, Martin. Uh, James, how are you? Very well, nice indeed. See you again. So, how's it been? We've got export distributors from all over the world now queuing up to take the product and it's just really getting our act together and getting our resources together to satisfy the demand. Show me, Martin. Yeah, absolutely. Let me see the proof of the pudding, shall we? All right. Welcome okay. to my den. You haven't got Duncan Bannatyne hiding in there, anyway, have you? No, no, I don't think we could fit him and his ego in this building. It's only 4,000 <laughs> square feet. True to form. The Dragon wants to drill straight down into the company finances. When you came onto the show, yeah. you were looking at an investment of 150,000 yes. for 10 per cent. And one of the concerns that obviously we had was you weren't making any money. Right. So what's actually happened? Well, I think I said on the, at the time that our uh, first half year sales were about 300,000. We forecast to do about 750. But this year, we are on schedule to do between 1.3 and 1.5 million. Despite the recession, Martin says that business is booming and he's now forecasting the kind of profit that's tempting for this dragon investor. To go from losing money to now making three to 400,000 profit, mm. I think it's great testament to you. I really do. Thank you very much. Are you still open to offers, Martin? You broke your checkbook. Yeah, I mean, I'm, <laughs> listen, I'm a dragon. I mean, I think that I would need 45%. Yes. I mean, do we have a deal? No. I'm out. I think he went really well. I was quite pleased with his overall take on the business. I think he's got a different view of it now. I'm glad it was James and not Duncan. A lot of people always ask me the question, is there one that got away? And up until now, I've always said, if I wanted it that badly, I would have done it in the den. But actually, for me today, this is probably one that there is a sense of regret. Finally, the tour travels to Leon C in Essex, a popular commuter town for the capital with an active fleet of cockle boats. It's from here that entrepreneur Natalie Ellis runs her business selling non-spill dog bowls. The den is a tough environment for any entrepreneur, but in 2008, Natalie's was a particularly emotionally charged encounter. She began her pitch by asking for £120,000 for 15% equity of her company. This may look like any other water bowl, but right now it's full of water. You could put it in your car, caravan boat, and you wouldn't spill a drop. This is because of this floating floor. This sits on the surface of the water, and the feed holes allow one mouthful of water through at any one time. When Natalie came with the product, I thought it was quite innovative. Over the past five months, I've sold 22,000 road refresher bowls and turned over £70,500 my aim is not to now take the road refresher to America. This is because this year alone, the Americans are expected to spend $10.5 billion on dog accessories alone. Natalie was presenting a successful concern, but she wanted the Dragon's help to unleash her product worldwide. 
Theo wanted to find out more about her business background. Tell me about Natalie. My past, I was in outdoors advertising sales. I left that eight years ago to go into the pet market. Well, in your own company? Yes. So the last eight years... In my other company. What was that called? Prestige Pet Products. And what happened to Prestige I Pet Products? I liquidated it. My first accountant I had... So it went bust? Well, yeah, yeah, I suppose it did. When Theo asked me about my past business, I, could, I didn't know, I couldn't remember. I'd not looked at any old figures and I was just totally unprepared. Natalie had faltered and she was not presenting a clear picture of her past. And Deborah Meaden also had doubts about the future that she was planning for her company. Can I ask you, what's your fascination with the States? The market there is so much bigger than it is here. To me, a much more obvious path would have been to actually penetrate the market within the UK. Yeah. Roll it out through Europe and roll it out through the States because you're doing so well. I actually got the product, so, and I think that there's a market for it. The trouble is that the path you've chosen has led you to ask for £120,000. I'm afraid at this level and with that future, I'm out. The Essex businesswoman had lost one dragon and it was about to get worse as Peter Jones stepped in. Natalie? Yes. Hello, I'm Peter. Hello. Hi, nice. Well, the thing is, you, the, the moment you're asking for £120,000 for 15% of the company, the whole business, I'd struggle to try and value it at £100,000, let alone £120,000 for 15%. I mean, you're obviously not my target market because I've, the amount of bowls I've sold, everybody loves it. I've had not one single Can I say that's, that, that's, that's a really poor comment? I'm obviously not your target market. No, it's, but if you had a dog... That it's you irrelevant whether I've got a dog or not. I'm an investor in businesses. OK. I don't have to actually be and buy everything I invest in and want to buy. I look at it as a business opportunity that's presented in front of me. I was expecting a business discussion with Peter, but he just ended up barking at me. Natalie had managed to alienate Peter Jones and something else was still troubling Theo Pafitis. I think it's a great product. So whilst I like the product, why am I so against investing in you? Something was nagging me about the way she was talking to us. You've sat here trying to explain to us what went wrong with your previous business and you couldn't tell us. There was obviously something that I didn't want to talk about and the only way they'd leave me alone, well, it just come out. If you must know, I had a TIA which is a mini-stroke. You had a TIA? I ended up in hospital, come back a bit like a vegetable. I couldn't remember anything. Having a stroke's a hard thing and it kind of makes you feel like you're not a complete person. It was just horrible. I just thought, just get me out of here. Take some time. Take some time. The dragons were taken aback by Natalie's revelation and it was a tense moment in the den. She should have been given credit for the fact that she was trying very hard not to be emotional in the den. She just wanted to be in there pitching her business and getting investment. Shall I explain? I don't think you need to explain. Um, I think it's incredible because you show absolutely no sign of it. It just seems that you've uh, climbed Everest to recover from that to do what you've done and you should be very mm. proud of yourself. Thank you. But I do believe there's a one-man band, a one-girl band, trying to conquer America. Just one step too much. So I'm out and I'm going to wish you the very best of luck and Excellent. well done. Lovely, thank you. OK. I knew they were all going to be out, so I just wanted them all to be out really quickly so as I could be out. Have you heard that expression? You know, America is the graveyard of UK businesses. No. Remember the phrase. It seems like a lifestyle business rather than an investable business. And for that reason, I'm out. But okay. good luck. Thank you. Natalie, I agree with James, it's a lifestyle business. You know, um, and there's no huge profit in this. So for that reason, I'm out. Natalie, it's not investment you want. I think it's help, infrastructure and support. Yeah. And I think you should join a larger organisation, learn from it, enjoy it, have your dream come true, and that's the reason why I'm out. OK, lovely, thank you. I had expected to go and get an investment. In fact, I wanted Theo Pathetis and I wanted Peter Jones. So I was absolutely devastated. 
Now, Theo has come to visit the entrepreneur to find out if she's gone ahead and conquered America on her own. I'm OK about seeing him. I mean, obviously, there's the past, but it's a fantastic opportunity to have Theo's here for a meeting. I mean, I really appreciate his input. Hello. Hi, how are you? I'm good, and you? Yeah. When we last saw you, you'd sold about 22,000 of these. Yeah. How many sold now? 260,000. How many have you sold? 260,000. And turned over? Over a million, so... That is unbelievable. Yeah. With such a high turnover, Natalie is well on the way to proving this is more than a lifestyle business. And she's achieved these impressive sales figures by doggedly pursuing her international expansion plans. My big ambition was to go to America and I thought I'd rather look back and say I tried and I failed than look back and say what if. I just bought a full container load of product, I sent it there, I set up a warehouse in Chicago and I just set up distribution. Because the dragons all said, don't be daft, you know, you could never do it, people in America, they were more determined to help me, so they done me a real favour. Natalie's product became the fastest selling dog bowl on Amazon USA and was recommended for President Obama's dog, Bo. Recognising a fantastic PR opportunity, Natalie produced a specially designed bowl. Oh my God. Which she's sending to the most high profile pooch in the USA and launching as a new retail product. I was thinking of putting this into mass production and manufacturing it and selling it around America. It just, of course, the tooling, how much is it going to cost to tool this up and is it ever going to make a payback? The tool on that is 17,000 on that particular size. I tell you what, it might be the best 17 and a half grand you spend. I think so. Just so as people see it and it'll be next to the original road refresh, right. it'll be, oh, there's that. Part. And they might buy the cheaper one, see this, buy the cheaper one, that's fine. Yeah. I'd go for it, Gil. Okay. I'd go for it. I'll I think take it's your a, I think I think it's that. very good. Fabulous. So Natalie, if you turn over a million quid at the end of this year, how much profit will you make? I'm only expecting to take in profit about 180,000 because a lot of it's going back into new products. Sorry. You're going to only make 180,000. Yeah. That's still 60,000 more than the money you asked for in the den. It is, yeah. You happy with that? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> And Natalie is trying to expand her market by developing new lines, making use of her patented technology. So what is the future? What other products have you got coming on? I've got baby products as well, one of which is a non-spill potty and another one's a non-spill cup. They can right. drink anywhere on this cup. Yeah, if they drop it, it doesn't spill. So it's like a growing up cup. Right, so we're moving away from doggies. No, we're staying with doggies, but we're diversifying. We're diversifying. Well. Yeah. So we're staying with doggies and moving to babies. Yeah. Who else uses the bowls? The fire brigade, the police, the search and rescue dogs in both England and America. Among Natalie's happy customers, the Essex dog display team, made up of animals from rescue shelters. As you can see, they've all got their own road refresher bowl, which means they can drive, they've got water on their journey, water doesn't spill, so their beds stay dry, and they turn up refreshed and not dehydrated. So, has Theo been won over on his visit? It's wonderful to actually see somebody from the den that's done well without investment. I'm constantly asked, do you regret not investing? If I had to say, was the one that I would like to invest in more than the others that I didn't, I reckon this one might be it, you know. I'm Tony Charles from hungryhouse.co.uk and this is my business partner Shane Lake. We're asking for £100,000 in exchange for 11% equity to make this a thing of the past. Hungry House is a website that makes it easier than ever before to find a takeaway restaurant and order a delivery. When you put your postcode in, you get a personalised directory of your local takeaways. It's a bit like the yellow pages, but all the menus are right there too. After you click on the food you want, we pass the order to the restaurant and they deliver like normal. We charge the restaurant 
a commission on each order. Domino's Pizza has proven that people enjoy ordering takeaway through electronic channels. They now deliver one in seven pizzas this way. Our website spices things up though by adding choice. We bring a range of restaurants and cuisines together where they compete for the first time on quality, service and value. The home delivered food market was worth £1.2 billion in 2004 and was growing at over 6%. A number of European countries have already seen the expansion of online takeaway and in the US the market leader generated food orders last year worth $100 million. In our first year of trading, with little online advertising, Hungry House attracted 7,000 customers who placed 15,000 orders. We've grown easily to 150 restaurants, covering a third of London. To fuel expansion and to use our time to market advantage, we need finance for restaurant recruitment, marketing and product development. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Shane Lake and Tony Charles have delivered a professional pitch for a £100,000 investment in Hungry House, their online service which allows customers to order takeaway from a wide variety of restaurants. James Kahn wants to dig deeper into their impressive sounding figures. Hello Tony, hello Shane, I'm James Kahn. Hi James. Hi, James. Good presentation. A um, couple of financial questions. Just give me uh, a little bit of idea on the 15,000 orders you've taken so far. What, what's the financial model around that? Well, we charge a commission on each order that we send. So what, what is the commission and what is it generated with the 15,000 orders? We're charging the restaurants 9%. Okay, so those Off. orders at 9% equates to how much? Well, this year we've uh, turned over £24,000. And what's your projection going forward? Well, our projection is um, turnover for year one, we're looking at £430,000. Mm -hmm. uh, expenses of that, we're looking at expenses of 400000 Turnover in year two will be £2 million with expenditure of £1 million. And year three, turnover will be £3.2 million with a net profit of uh, £2 million. OK. It's a calm and assured response from Shane and Tony. But one dragon is not bowled over by their slick presentation skills. Guys, hi, I'm Peter. Hi, Peter. Hi, Peter. Um, why wouldn't I do this myself? If I want to go and spend £100,000 of my money or anybody else's money, why do I need you? Well, the, the value in the business is the, the system design, coding, website. Well, no, that's not, there's no value there. Well, it's really the time it would take you to produce something Well, I could like do this, the, we so. could do that very quickly. <laughs> I don't think so. I think this, there's a lot of work here. What, what, is in the there, time what is there special on your site that a team of... I've got 40 developers full-time. How quickly do you think I could replicate that site? Quite quickly, but our um, So unique what is it about your... What's your unique competitive advantage? Well, th our focus is on building a community of customers. Well, so that's not a unique competitive advantage because that now means I'm going to go and employ two or three good salespeople that mm. go door knocking for me and open up some restaurants and get them their buy-in. I can do that myself. That's the reason why I'm out. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Guys, Peter's right. You've got nothing u unique. And I'm, I'm not actually convinced. I think what mo most people think is I fancy a Chinese tonight or I fancy an Indian tonight or I fancy... A I don't think you go onto a website and think what do I want to eat tonight? I just don't think that's people's thought processes. So, I'm out. I think Deborah sometimes lives in a different world. She's got a fantastic uh, house and a farm and she keeps chickens and she keeps organic food. So what does she know about buying takeaways? I mean, come on, Deborah. Two dragons out. It's an unexpected and early disaster for Shane and Tony. The businessmen are suddenly struggling to convince the remaining multimillionaires to invest and Theo Pafitis is about to make things even more uncomfortable for the duo. Shane, Tony, I'm Theo. Hi, Theo. Hi, Theo. <laughs> um, first of all, who else is doing this in the UK? At the moment, if you want to order a takeaway online, your options are very limited, uh, believe it or not. And um, our product is at the forefront of the market, except we launched in February 2006. A month afterwards, um, a competitor from Denmark launched. 
and they've got about four times as many restaurants as us at the moment. But their product was developed in 1999. Whoa, 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 whoa. You launched when? February 2006. And they launched March? March. And they've got four times the restaurants? Yes. They, they had a successful business yeah. in Denmark. No, no, no their <coughs> restaurants are in Denmark. No. Right, we're in England now. Mm -hmm. So they've, got, they've had to go and do exactly what you've had to go and do, and that is recruit restaurants. Yep. So they're pretty well advanced. They are. The big boy um, competitor, uh, the, the brand leader, if you like, has um, an asset, an asset of someone that would buy us out one day. Shane and Tony's pitch is starting to crumble. Going head to head with a rival with four times as many restaurants on their books is an extremely ambitious plan. Now James Kahn is keen to find out more about the competitor. How well have you been tracking your competitor that's got four times more sites than you've got? Very well. Yep. How many people do they have out there marketing? Do you know that? Uh, about four sales executives. That might be as many as five or six now that have gone into other parts of the UK. And what's your gut feeling with their volume? What, what are they doing? We can tell you what they're doing in Denmark. <laughs> no, I want to know what they're doing here. <laughs> well, I'm interested in Denmark, so let's do Denmark. 300,000 orders a month. OK, what does that convert into revenue, in your opinion? What are they generating on that? Well, very roughly, you could just take 10% of that. Oh, sorry, times by £15 average order. Yep. Uh, then divide by 10, so that's uh, 300,000. £1.50, and what is it, 300,000? It's half a million pound a month. Mm -hmm. It's a good more, six million a year. Far from being alienated by the success of the rival company, James Kahn is impressed by the profitability of this business model, and he's ready to declare where he stands. Let me start the process, gentlemen. Um, I actually do like the concept. I think as a business right now, I think it's quite fledgling. So I think what I would be interested in doing is um, I'd probably go in with £50,000, but I think I'd want 25% of the equity. Thank you. Shane and Tony have secured an offer for half of the £100,000 they need, but with only two other dragons still in, they'll need at least one to share James Kahn's faith in the business concept or they'll leave the den with nothing. I can tell you where I am now. The risks in your business are quite huge. You have got a very strong competitor that's out there doing the business a lot quicker than you and they're taking some of the market. And there was no barriers to market. A lot of other people can do this. All you need is cash and some nows. And there's a lot of people out there with nows and cash. When I take all those things into account, for me to invest in this business, I'm going to want a hell of a lot of equity. Do you know what? If we got to that stage, I think you'd lose your enthusiasm. <laughs> it could have a negative effect. Yes. Right. Purely for those reasons, I'm out. Theo Pafitis can't see a way of making the deal work and is the third dragon out. All that now lies between them and failure is Duncan Bannatyne. I can see this business having possibly the potential, but it is very risky. So for that reason, the only way I could make an offer for the other half of the money that you need is to agree with James on the equity level of 25%. So you have actually an offer for what you asked for, £100,000 for 50% of the company. Shane and Tony have been thrown a lifeline. The offer from Duncan Bannatyne and James Kahn allows them to walk away with an investment, but at a staggeringly high price. The young entrepreneurs will have to use all their negotiating skills if they're to secure a better deal. Well, we, we came in here with a, a limit, obviously, and that's considerably lower than, than that offer, unfortunately. Uh, you wouldn't uh, think about 10% each. <laughs> 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 
Just give me your numbers again. You said you were going to do, what was your forecast? For year one, yep. 430,000 turnover. 430. Year two? You, year two was 2 million. Yep. Year three? Year three is 3.2. 3.2 million. And your profit in year, year one? Year one was 30k. 30k. And then 1 million and 2 million. Okay. Um, okay. I'll tell you what I'm prepared to do. If you deliver your business plan, okay, I'm happy to drop from 25% in year one. I'll drop to 20% in year two if you deliver your number. And I'm happy to drop to 15% equity if you deliver your year three number. So if you can deliver what you say you can deliver, I'm happy to take a lower amount. If you can't, then I'm taking a higher risk, therefore I should get a higher amount. Yeah, I'd match that. Yeah. And that gives you back the incentive to, mm -hmm. to your quite rightly said that you would lose. Yeah. Can we have a chat, please? Yep, okay. Yeah. To get the £100,000 investment they need, Shane and Tony still face giving up 50% of their business. But if they hit the ambitious targets they've set themselves, the Dragons are prepared to give them 20% back. It's a tough decision for the pair. No, I, <laughs> I, I can't make this decision because I don't think we'll, I don't think we'll regret it. Well, um, as Tony mentioned, it is uh, quite a lot more than what we were willing to, to relinquish today. Um, we have absolute faith in the figures we, and the uh, business obviously being here today. Uh, and we also can see great value in what both of you can offer. Uh, so for that reason, uh, we've, uh, we'd like to accept your offers. Excellent. <laughs> Well done. Well done. It's been a roller coaster ride for Shane and Tony, but they're leaving the den with the £100,000 they came in for and with two new and very experienced business partners. After the den, the pair sat down with James and Duncan to discuss the deal. The way people ordered the food wasn't automated enough. They were using faxes and things like that. When you're only making a pound, per transaction, the technology has to be complete. James and Duncan realised that actually we probably weren't going to hit the targets that we'd originally said we would, and if they were going to keep 50% of the business, then you know maybe Tony and I weren't going to be as enthusiastic and accommodating in the deal. He thought we could based on that. It was just too time-consuming, and you had to trust the restaurant to pay the money. It just didn't work. The limitations of the website meant that the targets set in the den were unachievable. In the end, everyone agreed to walk away from the deal. That wasn't the end of their business. The pair set out on their own to automate the website. And three years on, Tony has developed a machine that fixes the problem. This works on the mobile phone network, and it means that we have a direct channel into the restaurant. So that results in much faster and more efficient routing of the orders. It's almost a different business from what we were when we went in the den. Going from the 15,000 orders for the year, we're now doing 15,000 orders a week. Today, the company reports a turnover of around a million pounds a year. But the duo still haven't made a profit because every penny they make goes back into the business. Its growth is funded by £150,000 from private investors. And now they're on the lookout for more. We're at a stage now where we really need to sort of step up the acceleration of our growth. We need to do another funding round in order to, to sort of generate that growth. And to provide them with the extra funding, Tony and Shane have someone in mind. We'd like Duncan to uh, consider us the uh, one that got away at the end of today's meeting. Um, you know, we are in the market for some more finance, so, you know, maybe we'll put the hard word on Duncan while he's here and see if he's got any spare cash on him. 
My partner have persevered and I understand that um, they're doing OK. Oh, how are you doing? Yeah, very right. good, very good. It's okay. improved to the extent where they can make a living. That's one thing, but if it looks like it could be a really big business and they're still looking for investment, then I'd certainly consider it. So how's things been? Yeah, it's going very well. It's Hungry House is uh, sort of going from strength to strength since we saw you, well, was three years ago now. Three years ago, yeah. The duo are keen to show Duncan that they've improved the technology behind their website. We've developed a nice new piece of kit called LiveLink, and that uh, is a wireless connection between sort of our servers and the restaurant. It's an impressive demonstration, but do the figures add up? That's a lot slicker than what it was. But what was your turnover been like? It's, it's completely different to three years ago. We did £24,000 in the year before yeah. Dragon's Den. Yep. Um, the last 12 months, we turned over £800,000. Wow, that's a big jump. Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah. Is that turned into profit? Well, you can almost look like we're reinvesting the profits month on month. Yep. So last... Well, yeah, even, it's... even if you got to the full potential, how much profit do you think you'll make then? Well, the profits is in the millions. long way to go. It's a big country. Yeah. So, uh, as it happens, we're looking for another round of funding at the moment um, to help us get to the next uh, next level. How much are you looking for now? Well, it's around a million pounds. Oh, just a million? Yes. <laughs> so it was 100,000, it was 150,000. Now you want a million pounds. So what profit do you think you'll be making when you exit? Well, at least two million pounds profit. Two million pounds profit. And how long, ago, how long will that be? That will be three to four years' time. Three to four years' time. I'm buying companies today at three times profit. OK. So that would give you a valuation in three or four years of £6 million. And you're valuing it today at £4 million. If you do what you say, the investor's going to walk away with £1.5 million. It's not a great return. The risk-reward ratio isn't very good. Mm. business lesson for the duo. Their valuation priced Duncan out of the market. Quite happily, they say, well, we need another million now. <laughs> it's like, well, when does it end? Tony and I are not in this for the short haul to make cash profit, if you like. We're looking to get the business to a point that it's valuable to have an exit. I don't think I will ever look back at this and think, I wish you'd put a million pounds in. There's a possibility, but it's very slim. 